Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to my channel, Runaway Slave 2.0. I would like to thank all of my subs and supporters who watch, share, like, and comment on the videos. In addition, I have to give a big up to all of my people who purchased my masterpiece, The N-Word is No Secret in the Service. If you would like to purchase this masterpiece, just go to the link in the pinned comment. Thanks again, everybody. Big up to you all. Let's cook. Okay. Here's another never forget story in our history that is often forgotten. And it's about a young sister by the name of Joetha Black Jet Collier. Her name is Joetha Collier. Her nickname is Black Jet, and we'll get into why later on. Joetha Collier was born in the farming town of Starkville, Mississippi on September 20th, 1952. She was the second child and only daughter of Gussie May and Jimmy Lee Collier. Joetha Collier's parents had a total of five children and they did the best they could to make ends meet. Joetha's father, Jimmy Lee, was a farm laborer. Her mother, Gussie May, was a domestic worker. In the year 1959, when Joetha was seven years of age, her father passed away from heart disease at the age of 35. After that, her mother, Gussie May, really struggled to make ends meet. She had five kids to raise on her own. Eventually, she met a man by the name of Paul Love. Paul Love is a rice farmer. He was a rice farmer. So they all moved in with Paul Love to the Mississippi Delta in the 60s, okay? So the family moved over there with Paul Love, and they relocated to a small town called Drew, Mississippi. Joetha Collier's mother and Paul Love, they did get married, and they had three more boys, okay? So now they have eight children in the house. Joetha is the only girl. Now, this town uh, called Drew, Mississippi, that Joetha lives in is pretty much the same place uh, that uh, Emmett Till was lynched at, okay? Terrible place to live, people. We're going to get into that. But for Joetha and her family, money was always tight, but they did what they had to do to survive. Since Joetha was a young girl, her mother, Gussie May Love, always found ways to uh, treat her special, Okay. Her mother would always give her gifts, give her special treatment, because she was the only girl. You know, she had different things than a boy. She had her own bed. She would have to get her hair done. You know, the girl treatment. Her mother did make sure of that because her mother understood what a girl needs because she's a woman and she's got all boys around. Joetha was also a natural athlete. Now, Joetha could beat all the boys running. She was fast, okay? Joetha's brother, Ernest Collier, said that when Joetha hit the track, she was like lightning. All the locals who knew her started to call her Black Jet. And that comes from how fast she can run and her dark skin complexion, okay? That's why she had the nickname Black Jet, okay? She was just straight up fast. Great athlete. Now, this place that Joetha is living in now with her family called Drew, Mississippi, let's get into that a little bit, okay? So we can understand where this story is going. Drew, Mississippi... First off, Mississippi is a terribly violent state for black people to live in. Historically, uh, Mississippi has always been terrible for our people as far as we know, you know? The great Fannie Lou Hamer called Mississippi land of the tree, home of the grave. If you haven't checked out the videos on this channel on Fannie Lou Hamer, please scroll down. Go check the videos out on uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. She, a true warrior for our people. Fannie Lou Hamer, check the videos out on her, please. In the state of Mississippi, there were 452 people lynched, black people lynched from 1889 to 1945, and they say that was about 13% of the late lynchings committed nationwide during that period. 452 black people lynched. These are the ones that are recorded, by the way, okay? Now, this place, Drew, Mississippi, located in the Delta, it was just known for just tearing black people apart. This place... This is a place that's very, very violent towards black people. It was, very, it was a dangerous place to live, nothing to play with. The white community here, very nasty, very mean, vindictive, and hateful, okay? And the black people in this town, they were terrified of white people, man. They were terrified. Not saying that they all were running scared, but, you know, they knew what these white people were capable of. And there was nobody around to help them because you have to remember also that the white community had local government in their corner to do these things, okay? Now, in these towns like Drew, Mississippi, all the white people knew each other, all the black people knew each other, okay? Actually, 
People in Drew, Mississippi, after the Emmett Till lynching, black folks in the town, there are many people that recall speaking to this guy, Roy Bryant, and knowing him, uh, and knowing uh, uh, the wife and everybody who did this to Emmett Till. Many black people in the town remember going to his supermarket, right? Because this guy, Roy Bryant, he had a supermarket. So, yeah, he did. He lynched. He did this to Emmett Till, lynched a young black boy, and he still made all kinds of money off of black people going to a supermarket, okay? He had a big supermarket. That's kind of a shame, you know, but I'm not going to get into that part right there because I don't know what these people were going through or the conditions as to why they had to go to this man's uh, supermarket. So I can't, I can't get that deep. So this Mississippi Delta place, just a hellish nightmare for black folks. I mean, you were literally amongst a bunch of pale knuckle-dragging beasts who felt that you as a black person had the worth of a roach or a fly. It was very simple for them to take you out. And they had the support of the gov government again. Another thing about black people in Mississippi is, which, you know, is a, is a nationwide thing, but black people in, in Mississippi were very, very poor. They struggled from extreme uh, unemployment, homelessness, uh, hunger, malnutrition. It was re uh, recorded that 68% of the black families in each Delta County lived below the poverty line in the early 70s. That's 68%, y'all, below the poverty line. When the SNCC, or the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went to Drew, Mississippi to organize residents, they said that the black people, the black community in Drew, Mississippi, was extremely scared. They were afraid to death. And they said, we understand why, because we, we, when we went there, we were scared to death. The white people in Drew, Mississippi, are considered some of the most uncooperative, stubborn, and resistant to uh, civil rights for black people, pro probably in the whole state of Mississippi, they say. This place, Drew, right here, where Joetha Collier lives, where she's being raised with her brothers and sisters. They're very resistant to civil rights for black people. So what happens is in, come Brown, in comes uh, Brown versus Board in the year 1954, and then a Civil Rights Act of 1965. Now, what that meant was, in order to remain eligible for federal aid, Drew, Mississippi, now had to integrate schools. So you know these Mississippi crackers, they are very upset. They're not going to go down without a fight. So what they decided to do when they were told that they had to integrate schools is they decided to create a loophole around integrating these schools. This is what all, the, all, this is what all white people did, by the way. Uh, the Drew School uh, Board adopted something called Freedom of Choice Plan in the year of 1965. Freedom of choice. So this meant that parents had the freedom of choice to select what schools they wanted their children to go to. Now, this is what the white community was thinking. They're thinking, if we give everybody freedom of choice, we are integrating schools, but these black parents, they're not going to choose to send their children to a white school because they know how we are, and they know if they come to a school with us, we're going to just give them hell and abuse them. They knew that the black students would be intimidated and things like that, so they didn't think that a black family would ever s select a school to send their black, uh, their black children to with all these white kids. So they figured, okay, we're doing what we have to do. Let's see what happens. But here's the deal. There was a brave black family who went ahead and called their bluff. In the year 1965, there was a sharecropping couple by the name of May Bertha and Matthew Carter. They shocked the white school board and Drew, and they enrolled seven of their 13 children in an all-white public school. Their children, Gloria, Ruth, Larry, Stanley, they desegregated Drew High School, okay? They desegregated Drew High School. And their younger siblings, Pearl, Beverly, and Deborah, desegregated A.W. James Elementary School. So they called their bluff. And this is, was a very courageous step. And um, they say in history, this was as notable and daring as any other high-profile school integration. But many of us don't know about this, okay? They sent all their kids into the school. And Drew, Mississippi, around these, these people are terrible, y'all. And the thing about it is the Carters found out that sending their black children to integrate these schools came with a very heavy price. When the residents, when the white community found out that they did this, they fired shots at the Carters family home and they were in, uh, uh, evicted from Pimble Plantation where they worked and lived. So they're getting kicked out and shot at for sending their children to these schools. Okay? 
When their children did go to school, they were met with violence and intimidation and extended to the classroom. The teachers participated in, it, in, in this as well, giving them unfair grading. They faced all kinds of racial abuse. The white uh, students were very angry. Their parents would come to school. They were very angry as well. The children who went there, the black children who integrated these schools and drew, they tried to do their best to avoid any ne unnecessary interactions with these white te uh, teachers, classmates, but they couldn't escape it, man. I mean, this was right around them everywhere. I mean, the children said that they would literally, they go to school, they got a bunch of white kids uh, shooting spitballs at them and just calling them uh, nigger and things like that. It was a real rough time. So what the Carter family decided to do in the year of 1967, they fought back. The Carter family filed a lawsuit against the Drew School District. With the, uh, They had a, a sister by the name of Marion Wright Edelman. She's an NAACP lawyer. She start, she's in charge of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. So the Carter family fought back. They won a case against the Drew School District. And what happened was, upon completion of them winning this case, they said that the Drew School District could never use, could no longer use this freedom of choice thing that they created as a smokescreen or a loophole to make sure that all the black children went here and all the white children went here. This is what, it was a setup, okay? We're going to let you choose where, you, where your, uh, your children go, knowing that you ain't going to choose these schools we at because you know we're going to abuse them. So they won that. They, the school district, now they had to get rid of this freedom of choice thing that they came up with, okay? So their smokescreen days were over. So, of course, the white community is not going, going to uh, go down without a fight. The white parents responded by taking their children out of all the public schools and sent them to private segregation academies. These private segregation academies is something that was going on throughout America when the white community, white parents would get mad that black children had to go to their school. There's nothing they could do about it. They created a smoke screen like this freedom of choice thing. If it didn't work out anymore, they would create these pri private segregation academies, okay? And... They would get together, make these private schools, and they also found a loophole as well to get government money and things like that from that. Some of these private segregated academies are still thriving and well today. You know, we just don't know the school. A lot of people don't know what these schools are. A lot of black people uh, would die to send their kids to these schools. Uh, but uh, uh, quite a few of these schools were started as private segregated academies in order to get away from black people to make sure that black people couldn't come to their schools. Still thriving today, some of them, okay? So that was the situation with the school. Now, I had to cover that because Joetha Collier is now going to Drew High School next year. She's going to the school that the Carters went, do, went to, and due to the fact that they won that case uh, against the school district, when Joetha goes to this school, she doesn't have to deal with all this... Uh, racial abuse, and things that the Carters went through because the school now is predominantly black. It went from predominantly white to predominantly black because all the white kids left. There were still some white kids there, but now the school is predominantly black. So Joetha Collier, she doesn't have to go through all this racial bullying and things like that. So in high school, Joetha Collier, she was known as an easygoing, great student, student, very magnetic. Everybody liked her. She was pretty. She was popular. She was a great athlete. She was always a nice person. Joetha Collier did everything right. I mean, she was like an angel or something like that. She was a very focused student. And as I said earlier, in, this, uh, in the state of Mississippi, it was very terrible. A lot of poverty for black people. And Joetha Collier seen school and education as the way to provide for her family. So she's going to school. She's a great student. She's doing her one-two in school. She's doing good. Okay. Joetha has plans to go to college and become a teacher. She's also an athlete. Uh, she's really on the right path, y'all. She's doing everything right. Now, she, go, uh, she goes through high school, goes through her high school years as a great student. She's excited. She's planning to graduate high school, and her goal, she's going to attend Mississippi Valley State, which is an HBCU, on a scholarship when she graduates. Joetha is going to be part of the first class of black students to graduate from Drew High School. So these black students were very excited, very proud. Now here comes uh, graduation day. So now here comes graduation day. Everybody is happy for Joetha. All of her brothers are happy. Her parents are very happy. Unfortunately, Joetha's mother and father couldn't attend the graduation to watch Joetha walk across the stage because they both had to work. But on the morning of the graduation, Joetha told her mother, as soon as I graduate from college, mama, things are going to be different for you. Now, although Joetha's parents couldn't attend the graduation, 
They made sure that she had everything that she needed. She had her class ring paid for, all of her class materials, her pictures, everything's done and paid for for Joetha. Joetha wore a nice brand new yellow dress, okay? They said that Joetha was beautiful in her new yellow dress. She was known for being slim with beautiful dark skin, and her, air, her hair was often in big bangs, okay? Joetha's brothers were very excited for her as well, but Joetha's brother David remembers having a strange feeling on the day of Joetha's graduation. He said that uh, things just seemed to be going wrong. Him and his brother Lewis were responsible for driving Joetha to the graduation, and he says he remembered the car had a flat tire and they didn't have a spare. They were still able to get Joetha off to the graduation, so Joetha goes to the graduation. She graduates. The other students graduate. They're all very happy. This is the first class of black students to graduate from Drew High School. After graduation, new graduates, they went to hang out at a place called Eddie and Susie's Cafe to celebrate their accomplishments. So now I'm going to read from an article, okay? They're, at, they're, they're celebrating their accomplishments after the graduation. I'm going to read now word for word. It is late evening on Tuesday, May 25th, 1971 in Sunflower County, Mississippi, in the small delta town of Drew. A young, a young black woman stands on Union Street in a yellow dress. She is a teenager, thin, pretty, and dark-skinned, with straight black hair and thick bangs. At this moment, she is chatting with friends near Eddie and Susie's Cafe, a popular hangout at the end of a day celebration. A car is cruising down Union Street towards the cafe. Inside are three white men who have been drinking beer by the court. The driver's window opens. A hand emerges, holding a 22 caliber pistol. There is only one shot, but it find the, finds the young woman, Joetha Collier's neck. The car drives off. As she fell to the pavement, newspapers reported she was still clutching on her high school diploma. Joetha Collier was trans, uh, was uh, taken to the hospital, but she passed away from this one shot. Joetha Collier was 18 years old when she died. Condolences to the family of Joetha Collier. She's a young black woman who was killed simply because some nasty Mississippi white American crackers were upset that some black people were happy. Had nothing to do with them. They were upset at the energy that was going on at the time. The school, the school was uh, integrated by black people. They have a black class. There are black people outside. They're happy and celebrating. Uh, they're also upset at some people coming through. Drew trying to encourage black people to vote and things like that. You know, these are the type of things that will make people from the white community very upset and bitter. Now, there was a student who was interviewed who graduated with Joetha named Harvey Birchfield. He said he remembers being with a group of students near the cafe having a good time, but he needed to step away and make a phone call. So he went to a phone booth not too far away. He remembers seeing a white man pass by and jump in the car. He said after that, the car pulled out. Then he heard a shot. He said he didn't think much of it at first. He thought that it was just one of his classmates shooting in a trash can to celebrate the victory for graduating. He said it took him several moments to realize what had happened. He recalls seeing Joetha slumped over. Joetha's been shot, he heard a classmate scream out. The next few minutes passed. There was a bunch of panic. Joetha was taken to a hospital in Ruleville. So... This is a very messed up, sad story. Uh, the white men who did this to Joetha were caught. There was no motive besides what I said. Black people being black, progressing, celebrating, you know, just bitter crackers in Mississippi, as they are to this day. They did this for no reason. They decided, oh, let's shoot a black person, and they did it. The shooters were Wayne Parks, 25 years old, his brother Wesley Parks, 26, and their 19-year-old nephew, Alan Wil Wilkerson. They revealed that Wesley Parks is the one who pulled the trigger. There were no words exchanged between these men and the students who were out there. They didn't even know who the victim was going to be. They just said, we're going to let off a shot. This guy, Wesley Parks, he later claimed that he was in a drunken stupor, and he said he has no recollection of what happened that night. Many people questioned this narrative, though. They said because after he did this to Joetha, they all drove 10 miles went to a party, and played pool for 45 minutes. Wesley Parks was finally convicted of murder. 
on uh, March 5th of 1972, the district attorney by the name of George Everett announced the dismissal of the charges against his brother and his, that was his brother and his nephew. He said, we have no charge we could try them on after pre previous trial. So we, people, you know that's a bunch of BS. These guys were in the car. They might have got the weapon. They might have cleaned the weapon. They might have loaded the weapon. But there's nothing you could charge them with. They're supposed to get the same amount of time as him. But anyway, this is the white community, y'all. In 1973, after his appeals to overturn his 20-year sentence were denied, Wesley Parks began his imprisonment at the Mississippi State Penitentiary. Now, what's messed up about this story right here is when Wesley Parks went to prison, he received special treatment immediately. After one week in his sentence, he had acquired the privileges of something called full trustee. And this is a managerial role within the prison, and which means that he could live in a front camp which was reserved for professionals who happen to be prisoners. This drunk thug who killed this young lady, he's already living a good life in prison. So here we have the white community taking care of a man who did this to a black child. It means absolutely nothing to him. To them, I mean. So, people, this is the story of what happened to Joetha Collier, um, a young black woman who was taken out just for graduating. Um, there are so many stories like this nationwide, so many stories like this in the state of Mississippi. And I don't like to minimize anybody's uh, trauma or what happened, but, you know, we often, people go over the Emmett Till story quite often. It's a very big, popular story, but this Joetha Collier story should be out there like that. People should know about this story just as much as they know about the Emmett Till story. This is a big deal, okay? This is a big deal. Uh, some people have some reasons for why they believe the Joetha Collier story wasn't pushed as much, and they say it has something to do with the fact that she was one of the first black students to integrate this school. And they say some people from the black community, they, they want to make it seem kind of like them integrating schools was such a good thing or nothing came behind it. They don't want to talk about that, they say. They say that this, they say that this is kind of like the black community keeping this kind of on the low because they don't want to, they want to make it seem like them integrating schools were like a victory. But there are situations like this where somebody like Joetha Collier was taken out. The Carters, people don't know about their story. One of the biggest stories in our history, you know? A lot of people don't know about that. Uh, Joetha Black Jack Collier, a sad story, you know? They did have the NAACP there in their town, Drew. They had all kinds of marches and things like that. The youth was uh, very pissed off. But after that, it was kind of forgotten from our history, you know? Uh, and that's just what that's just what happened, man. This this happens so often to our people. Uh, no storyline, no backstory. Just some white guy who wanted to do this to a, a black person. And this is what white supremacists do to this day, or what they want to do. Now, the thing about this is, this is the thing about this, man. It didn't take in this story with Joe. I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over how this relates to what happens now. Um, in this story, so we have Joetha Collier, right? A young black woman. She was taken out by some random losers from the white community simply because of the energy that was going on with the black community at that time. In the town, they seen black people trying to get other black people to vote. They seen this school being integrated. They seen black students outside happy, celebrating their accomplishment. So, it doesn't take, it just goes to show, it doesn't take the act of government. It doesn't take a white politician. It doesn't take a white police chief. It doesn't take a white school board member. It doesn't take any of that for people from the white community to exercise their power within a religion of white supremacy. So these people who did this to Joetha Collier, for example, they could have just been sitting back at home, heard something about, I'm just using examples, Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton, I mean, anything in the news about black people trying to be independent. And they sit around listening to the radio and get angry and pissed off. And what they'll do is say, hey, we can't get to them. We can't get to this guy. He's in Colorado. This guy's in, in uh, I, I don't know, New York. This guy's in Chicago. 
Let's get somebody here for them because any black person will do, you know? And this is what they do. This is what they did back then. This is what they still do. Now, the way they do it now, and I learned, I learned a lot of this from paying attention when I was in law enforcement. White people use the power that they have on every level to exercise white supremacy. And due to the fact that they're given this power by their community, they do it. So, for instance, if a white person is at home and he watches, suppose he's the manager at, I don't know, Amazon Warehouse. He watches the Super Bowl. He, he's mad because it's a black quarterback. He turns the channel. He sees some black person singing. I don't know. He hears, example, Obama on TV talking. Then he turns the channel when he sees, I don't know, Al Sharpton talking. This one white guy who's just a manager at Amazon Warehouse, he can get up and say, you know what? I'm sick of these people. I can't get to that black quarterback. I can't get to Obama. I can't get to Al Sharpton. But I'm going to get some of their people back for what I'm, what I'm pissed off about. So this dude goes to work, starts writing black people up, starts firing black people. This is what they do. It could be a white woman at Human Resources who's angry and upset about something that she's seen dealing with black people that pissed her off. She gets to work, she's balling up your application. You put in for a promotion. She's getting rid of this paperwork. She's removing your name from the database. Why? Because she has the power to do so. That's why I say it only takes one white supremacist to screw your life up. It's really messed up because they all on some level have some power. It doesn't even have to be all the way up. You know what I'm saying? It could be an average schmo, an average Joe schmo, a nobody, and they can exercise the religion of white supremacy and do something to your life. I learned that in law enforcement, whereas, you know, white guys in law enforcement, what they would do is they'd get really upset about things that absolutely really make no sense. And it's usually always these shine bone Negroes that they get mad about. That's what's crazy part. They, they get mad about these old shine buck dancing type Negroes who really don't even care about us anyway, but they're all out in the media. You know what I'm talking about, the Ben Crump type people, the Al Sharptons. They might see Obama or they might see Oprah Winfrey. Think, you know, black people that really don't care, man. You know, they're in it for a bag and that's it. Keep it moving. Not talking about real systemic issues to fight the religion of white supremacy. They do things on the surface, yes, but things like that. These white people will see this. And what, I'm ch what they do, y'all, this is what they do. They get pissed off. So now if somebody's a, a, a police officer... Now, because their feelings are hurt about what they've seen with a black person doing or some black people doing, uh, uh, black people saying, now they're going to racial profile more. Now they're going to intensify the police brutality. Now they're going to pick up, they're going to do this a little more. They're going to intensify because they're trying to exercise the religion of white supremacy within the power that they have. It may not even be much, but they can do something to a black person. This went on like crazy when Obama was in office. When Obama was in office, Black people were getting tore up. They were getting ripped to shreds. I'm talking about Lynch shot in the head, you know, everything, because white people were mad about seeing him. Now, what's messed up about that is he didn't care to do anything for those black people who were supporting him, who were getting a behind whipped every day behind him being there. You know, you should know how white people operate. But this is what, that's just an example. And I've seen that you know, in the field of law enforcement. This is what they do. They get mad about things, they'll go take it out. A white woman who gets mad at white supremacists, she gets mad about something, she'll go work, she'll go to work, take it out on a black woman at work, take it out, oh, no, we can't do this today. No, you can't call out. Nah, uh, this is your last time. I know you have to babysit. We're not letting you use your sick leave. No. No, we're going to write you. You know, things like that. This is what they do because they're upset and mad at some black people for something that they seen that hurt their feelings. It may not have anything to do with you. This is why I despise a coon so much. Because I know, well, a celebrity coon. Because I know the same people who sit around and clap for and love and adore these celebrities, even take up for them when you say something about them, I know that when these people hit the media and say certain things, the black person who's sitting around applauding them and loving them and taking up for them is the one that's going to pay for it when one of these white people get mad, because them people are protected by white people, white liberals. You know, that, that's, that's just an issue. That's why I despise these celebrity coons. That's why I don't like 
any of them. I don't like any celebrities, pretty much, uh, movie stars, athletes, or whatever. I'm on that shut up and dribble stuff, and that's it, unless they represent something different for their people. There are some special ones, okay, but very rare. But that's just an example of what happened to Joetha Collier. I mean, these, these uh, Mississippi crackers, these white supremacists, they went out and did this to her because they're mad, you know, because they're mad. And this is what they do to this day. It doesn't have to be the person that they're directly mad about. It could be because of a decision. Oh, I'm going to do something about that. Oh, you're going to pay for that. Condolences to the family of Joetha Blackjack Collier. As you can see, this is where she got her name from, Blackjack, because she is a super athlete and she's very fast, okay? And also, people, to add insult to injury, the Department of Justice did finally close the Joetha Collier case in the year of 2020 with no additional charges, okay? That's how they do us. So, the story of Joetha Collier, people, please watch the story on Fannie Lou Hamer as well. Anyway, easy.